Dear Lord, thank you so much for tonight and for the opportunity to meet together as women. I thank you for the families that are represented here. And would you bless these ladies and their families as they desire to grow with you and to learn more about you and what your word says. And tonight in particular about our words and encouragement and how we can build up or we can really hurt. I pray that our hearts would be open and Lord that you would speak to each one of us. Thank you for the opportunity to gather and to learn and to grow in our walk with you in ways that then spill over into the way that we parent and the way that we treat our spouse in the way that we engage in friendships. We love you, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so tonight, I'm going to be talking with you about the power of our words. Have any of you had words this week that encouraged someone? Yes. How many of you were encouraged this week by the words of someone? Have any of you had words this week in which you were not kind? that came out of your mouth? You're not the only one. Me too, me too, and I'm gonna share those with you. <laughs> so Terry said she tried, has tried not to talk the last couple of days because the Bible actually does say that. When our mouths are closed, we do less damage. <laughs> that was my version of what the Bible says. But we're gonna talk about the power of our words and our kids memorize this song, so you've heard me sing before, but it's death and life are in the power of the tongue. And each one of us has a tongue, so each one of us is capable of both of those, and we do both of those. And the song goes like this. If you know it, join me, please. <clears throat> death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue or in the power of the tongue. Are you wondering why you've never heard that on the radio? <laughs> it's because our family made that up. <laughs> Thank you, Kim, for joining me. <laughs> now, when this is shown on our website, I'd like for you to repeat it and learn that by the time we meet together next month. <laughs> so I'm going to read from James 3, one through six, and it's titled, The Untamable Tongue. Just that title right there. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. Therefore, that tells you right there, we all stumble in this area. Able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body look also at ships although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things see how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire a word a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. That is our tongue, and we cannot control our tongue without desiring to and asking the Holy Spirit to take control of us. So there's some things I wanted to look at tonight about this. <clears throat> but according to that verse, those verses, every one of our homes has issues with the tongue. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. And it's not just us as the moms, it's our husbands, but we're not about him. We have to trust the Lord. I mean, we are about him, you, you understand what I'm saying. But we have to let the Lord work in his heart. And when the Lord provides opportunities for us to speak to an issue where he, we've been hurt or he perhaps has spoken ugly to the children, we are to speak up in love and address those things when our motive is right, recognizing that we too have a problem with our tongue. But we want, I mean, but also our children have problems with their tongues. 
Or are my children the only ones? Okay. This Sunday, I heard a sermon from uh, 1 Samuel 24, and I, have you ever had those moments in scripture where they're aha moments, when y'all study the Bible through, like I just mentioned earlier, before we started filming? You can have aha moments all the time, and it's really fun. But this is one of those moments for me. So we're reading 1 Samuel 24, and this is when Saul was chasing after David, and David's leader, leadership are saying to, to him, okay, Saul is still right now. You can kill him. It's a great time to kill him. And David could have, in, in our opinion, I feel like he should have. I mean, Saul has been brutal to him, right? David cut his robe. Remember this part? He cut his robe. And immediately he was convicted. He was convicted right away of doing that. And the, the people with him, his, his peeps, were saying, you should kill him. And all he did was cut this robe, and he was convicted about how disrespectful and rude he was to Saul. So this pastor said the link between conviction and repentance is a measurement of our relationship with Christ. I never thought about that before with that story. David just cut his robe. But he knew that was wrong to do, and he immediately went to Saul and said what he had done. And then he said, I had opportunity to kill you. He bowed down too, by the way. He bowed down to him to show respect. And he said, I had opportunity to kill you, and I did not. And I swear to you this day that I will not try to kill you. So, wow, conviction and a turnaround of the heart. And how are we in that kind of situation when we are unkind with our words? I mean, if you're like me, you were unkind sometime this week already, maybe today, probably today. But we should be immediately, <clears throat> excuse me, immediately convicted when we have wronged someone else, when we've lashed at them uh, for not doing what we wanted or they violated our rights. And we need to immediately go to them and apologize and not say, but, but I had the right. David could have said, Saul, you understand I have the right to kill you. You're trying to kill me. We could say that, but God says, no, I am in control. And what you may see as frustrating, big obstacles, I'm doing a work in your heart. And I want you to control your tongue and tame it. And you're going to need me, Christ, to help. So I just thought that was neat about um, that example. So I'm going to share with you something that I did that was so ugly. And I hope you don't just get up and leave after I share about this. Because I will say some nice things that I did. I hope, I hope something will come to mind. <laughs> okay. So this week, my girls are two younger girls are playing volleyball. When I say younger, they're middle school and high school um, student now. So they're playing volleyball and we're homeschooling. So that means I was with them during the day enough to be very frustrated about the amount of schoolwork not being done that I wanted to be done. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and it could have been done, but it was like an hour. I know your kids are not like this. But it was like an hour of complaining and then one math problem, you know, and then it just felt like that anyway. And when she finally got to do her work, it took like 20 minutes. She goes, oh, yeah, aren't you proud of me? Well, we actually just spent longer, you know, da dealing with your heart <laughs> than doing that. So the day had kind of been like that all day. And I don't even remember all the different things that happened. But I do remember how ugly I was. And so we're driving to volleyball and something was said, again, don't even remember that, but I said this in the car while I'm driving. And I hope y'all done, I hope you haven't done this, but I hope you'll make me feel better if you've done it. <laughs> but I said, you are a brat. You are a brat. The way that you're behaving, you are so self-centered, blah, 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 blah. And I went on and on and on. Have you ever done that? 
And I was like, how much longer do we get to it? Because I think I'm going to go on the whole time. <laughs> I don't like it. It's on my tongue. <laughs> and I kept going on and on, crushing my child. And then the other one asked a question, and I was on a roll. You know, when you're on a roll, she didn't even do anything, but I attacked her. And she goes, Mom, you asked my opinion about something. I said, but I know, but you could do it done. I mean, I didn't say that, but I felt like that. And so she said, Mom, if you are going to ask my, she was really sweet how she said it. Mom, if you're going to ask my opinion and then you, you lash out like that, you're teaching me not to give my opinion. And she was right. But I kept going. Because <laughs> I didn't know how to get out of this mess. That's for another blog post. <laughs> so anyway, I was convicted right away. Have you ever felt like that? Like the second, though, in fact, before those words, you're a brat, came out of my mouth, I was thinking, my mom never did this. <laughs> my mom never called me a brat. I'm about to do it. You're a brat! <laughs> and then I felt so bad that I kept going. Anyway, about 10 minutes later, we're there at the volleyball, you know, dropping them off for volleyball. And I was like... I got to apologize. So I said, I stopped and I we stopped the car and I looked at both of them, turned around and I said, the words that came out of my mouth were so ugly and so hurtful and damaging. And I know I was wrong for saying those things. We forgive me. And then we prayed and they it said yes, told him I loved him. I did not say, but you realize you pushed me to the limit and then some because an apology is what I own. And I own the lack of self-control. I own the vile, the ugliness that came out of my mouth. And we know that the ugliness is in our heart and that's what spoke and damaged my daughters. Now, maybe you've done things like that before. If your children are grown and God brings something to mind of a way that you've damaged them, even if it was five years ago or 10 years ago or longer, the Holy Spirit convicts you of that. Make that link from conviction to apology to restoration quick and all you have to do for that because if you're thinking well how do i do that that was a long time ago you simply say i thought of this today and i believe it's the holy spirit showing me i damaged you i hurt you and i wanted to ask you to forgive me for my unkind words and that's how we are to operate our whole lives ladies now if you have little ones under your feet which most of you do all the way up because we're going to continue to have a tongue that is hard to tame. Is that correct? Yes. And we must recognize the Holy Spirit convicting us. Don't y'all feel that when you, even before you say something ugly and we choose, we choose. I'm mad enough that I'm going to do it this time because you cross the line and God says, no, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long suffering. You know, our words show our spiritual maturity. Second Timothy 2 16. Stay clear of pious talk. That is only talk. Words are not mere words. You know, if they're not backed by a godly life, they accumulate as poison in the soul. James 1 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. I always think of these verses and I think of how fathers provoke not your children to wrath. It was just not that many years ago where I saw that verse through a new light. We provoke our kids. And when our words slam them and hurt them and cut them because of our self-absorption, because we've been inconvenienced or hurt, or we have rights and they're not crossing it, and we've damaged them, 
we are pushing them, provoking them to wrath. And we need to recognize that and own it and change our behavior and apologize. And you can read yesterday's blog post, uh, or is it, it's actually today's on um, regret. And what was the other word? Mistakes and regrets. And that'll give you a great little outline of what to do. We will battle this our whole life. But God is a great God and he wants to use our journey in life. He wants to use all of us. And when he, when we grasp how we've hurt someone, we offer more grace. It's a beautiful thing. So are you growing with the Lord? Are you sensitive to his small voice? When he says, don't do that. You don't know the whole story. And when he says, how about seeing things through their perspective? You only see it through yours. And Terry, with you working with children, you probably have learned, I'm sure you have learned, that there's a story behind children whose character uh, seems to be awry. There's oftentimes hurts behind there. And not just when you work in children's ministry, but all of us need to recognize the importance of seeing things through another person's perspective and watching our words. <clears throat> our words and the way in which we speak are critical to unity. And do you want a home? It starts in our home. Do you want a home that's unified, where it's harmonious? Our words play a significant role in that. So I don't know where everyone is in, in their home life. I'm sure we have a spectrum. We might have people here thinking, we've got this. But I would venture to say most of us are on the other side or in between where we're maybe even right now today, you want to cry because there's such friction at home and conflict going on. And I'm telling you, God is a redeemer. But it starts with us saying, Lord, thank you for showing me what's going on. You know that there's a problem with the words in our home and start with yourself. Lord, reveal to me how my words feel on the other end. Lord, show me how I treat my husband. I might think I'm being kind or I'm standing up for myself, but my children are learning through my actions about a stubborn nature, about having the last word, about being better, about putting him down. The Lord will reveal that, and that's another, it's just a beautiful thing, really, to walk with the Lord and have Him show these things to us, because then we can refine them, we can give those to Him. And then ask the Lord, show me how I treat my children. How does that child receive me? And there have been times in my parenting, and I've spoken of them to you at Cultivate, where I don't quite have one of my children's hearts. And I go to the Lord, I go get on my knees, and I fight a battle over their heart. Asking the Lord, show me their heart, show me where I'm responsible for not listening. They were ready to talk, and I didn't even recognize it because it was an inconvenient time for me. We got to be in the convenient time for the children mode to talk with them and stop what we're doing and be there. Or in grants, family, um, the one doing the videoing. I might have shared this already, but his mother used, I mean, she taught one of the very first ladies night out that I ever had. The one of the things I remember her saying was that she would lay on the boys. He has an older brother. She would lay on their beds at night and just allow them to talk. And in the darkness, they would open up. And I'm sure you both have different personalities. So probably one would talk more than the other. But a mother's heart, you fight to, to get that child's heart. And you ask the Lord, show me when the right timing is, where are the right words. This is really bugging me about it. And the Lord says, but you show grace. Don't bring that up yet. Just find out how he's doing. And God will guide you in that. He will help us control our tongues to bring unity in the home. But it starts with us. And we all have work to do in that area. Are you, is that true or is it just me? Okay. Our words and the way in which we speak are crucial or critical to unity. As we learn to speak the truth in love, we have to be sensitive to when we speak, how we speak. 
in a way that builds up, and to whom we speak. Proverbs 21 and 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. <laughs> Psalm 141, 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Ooh, I have a friend that prays that every morning. <laughs> <laughs> our words reveal our heart. It's like a mirror of our heart. So ladies, if you're spending time, we all should be spending time in God's word, even if it's just starting the day off real quick before you check email or Facebook or open the refrigerator, whatever kind of self-discipline you can build in to your day to just spend time. Like when my feet hit the floor, I like to say, good morning, Lord. Like, boom, you have just put that something in your routine so God is honored, boom, right away. And what was I going to say about that? Anybody know what I was going to say? <laughs> Boom, shakalaka. <laughs> um, something about, oh, spending the time with the Lord. When you've done that, you've, you're much more apt to have a controlled tongue, don't you think? So we, that's just a plus of that. Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man like me in the car that day, an evil heart out of an evil, an, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The, the pressure can be on me, but what's gonna come out is what's in my heart. So I need to fill my heart, my mind, with the things of the Lord. Our words reflect our intent to heal or hurt. Whew. That's good, isn't it? Have you ever just wanted to hurt somebody with your words? Proverbs 12, 18. <clears throat> there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise does the opposite. It promotes health. Proverbs 15, 4. Kind words heal and help. Cutting words wound. Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the bones. I mean, this is truly talking about your health. Like words affect our health. They affect our bones, our joints, our hearts. Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse man sows strife and a whisper separates the best of friends. Ladies, do you control your tongue or do you find it part of your normal life to call up a friend and gossip? Or when you're with a certain group of friends to belittle other people I think something that helped me with that area is to recognize if I'm sitting around talking bad about somebody else, when I recognized that the way Christ saw that in my life was such ugliness, but it was for me to talk bad about somebody else meant I thought I was better than somebody else. And I didn't want to do that. I really knew I didn't want to be prideful and be better, that's exactly my heart. So out of the ugliness of my heart, my mouth spoke. Did I take the time to get to know the other people? Did I do what the Bible said, says to do and do good to the others, to invest in them? When your children come to you about a child who's been ugly to them, what do you su suggest to them? Do you tell them you've had enough? Do you tell them, well, you tell your teacher about it and you this and that are you you know or they don't know any better than that so just ignore them <clears throat> what does the bible say to do it says pray so when your child has something unkind to say even if somebody has attacked them verbally or been ugly pray with your child you're teaching them how to handle problems in life teaching them to go to christ and then you can follow it up with, now I know they've been unkind, but I don't want you to share it with any of your friends. 
because you'll hurt their reputation, the person that's being ugly to you. And we don't want to do that. God says, pray for them. Let's do that now. And then he says, do good to those that hurt you. So what kind of things can we do good? How can we speak kindly of that person? If you think of things that they do well, how can we invest in that person? See, our training should re reflect the Bible. Now, our words, well, I told you this one already, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's a good one. Our words reveal a focus on self or a focus on God or others. Oh, that is so true. When you start, when you're starting to be ugly, just think of that. My words are either focused on myself or Christ, which allows you to then be focused on other people. James 3, 9 through 11, with it we bless our God and Father with it the tongue, and with it we curse men who have made who have been made in the likelihood of God. Likelihood? Likeliness. Likeness. Typo. <laughs> Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. <clears throat> and we're guilty of that. So I'm going to tell you another two examples. Okay, so there's this one. I can tell you a lot of them. But there was a time when Heather was, um, she probably was preschool or early elementary age, and she was helping me cook. She's one that liked to be in the kitchen from an early age, and she pulled the eggs, a crate, crate, <laughs> carton. The 12 things is a carton? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Have I ever told you I struggle with vocabulary recall? <laughs> So anyway, she pulled out a carton of eggs and they went all over the floor and cracked and made a mess. And she looked at me, she must've been younger than elementary school because she was, she looked at me like that and I realized the reaction that she had, by the way, if your children have that reaction, it's a little note to self. Like when you, like when you are going to pet somebody's dog and you, reach out your hand and the dog moves, you wonder if the dog's been hurt, right? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That expression made me, like, it just startled me. But for us, we all need to take a look at reactions of our kids. Are they worried about our response? Have we trained them based on our behavior to expect hurtful words or reactions? And if you see that or when you see that, Apologize. Change. But anyway, so she kind of stopped dead in her tracks and I noticed it and I just went right down to her and I held her little face real gently and I just looked at her and I said, Heather, it's okay. And when your little girl <clears throat> your little girl drops eggs on the floor one day, remember that this was my reaction. It's okay. And she can still talk to you, talk about that today, maybe because I teach women and I've repeated the story. <laughs> That's probably why. Um, so I'll need to all teach women and repeat stories, okay? But that really made an impact on her that one particular time because she was expecting something different than that happened. What about when your kid breaks something in the house or spills something on your new carpet? How do you react? However you react is how you are. Do you show people over things? Is that part of just how you operate life? Because if you do, your words will reflect that. You're like, that's fine. Now, I'm gonna show something that is a reminder in my home of painful words of how I hurt the child. So this other child of mine just loved, just loved little things. And this is what the story is going to expose how, how my focus was on myself. And because of that, my reaction was what you're about to see. I don't like clutter. And this was at a particular time that I was overwhelmed by stuff. And that can put me over the edge pretty fast. 
Is anybody else like that? No. <laughs> okay. Those, if you're not like that, you're like, what? <laughs> so I must have been going through one of those periods of just kind of like, don't want anything else in this house. So we had a little garage sale going on in the neighborhood. And picture these little kids all riding their bikes together, six little ducklings. She had a quarter. And imagine, this is why we need to see through their eyes. I've done this since this terrible example. Picture this little girl with her quarter making a decision on a gift to give to her mom. And she looked and she looked and she bought me this. And I had this sitting in our den as a reminder of her thoughtful gift and my painful words. I hope she doesn't remember that part of the equation. It's a reminder because my reaction was, get that out of here or something like that. And now I think this is beautiful because a little girl traveled afar <laughs> on two wheels with a quarter and bought flowers for her mom. When your children bother you, do you ever think to see through their perspective? Like the paper trimmings when they're creative and you're so frustrated and you're like, get that up, clean up the floor. Put it away, put my scissors back. And from a child's perspective, they're creating. But the ugliness coming out of your mind, your not mine, but your heart is a reflection on the irritation of somebody messing up your house or messing with your scissors. Do you get that? So it's good for not just for our children, but for everyone, people we work with, people in our neighborhood, our spouses, to see things through their eyes and appreciate the beauty from their eyes, their vantage point, or the heartache from their perspective that we should be patient about and come alongside. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 10. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing, for he would love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile or deceit. Ladies, there's an example in my life I can't go into a lot of detail about, but there were some people that were so incredibly unkind to me years ago, and they did not understand the whole picture. This happened to be when Kelsey was going through uh, the brain trauma that she had had, and she did very unkind things. She owned it, but yet she wasn't mentally in the right mind to even address it with her. So I understood their perspective and how frustrated they were. I understood that. There came a point, like that verse means a lot to me, because I was like, when Kelsey was healed after several years, I wanted to go by the way, God worked in my heart is one of the most beautiful things he did in my heart during that time to keep my mouth closed, but to go to him, not holding bitterness. Ooh, they're so be I did that too. I did that, but I would release it to him and lay it down on his feet and say, Lord, you're allowing me to go through this for a reason. It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I just want you to know that. But I kept taking it to him and trusting his sovereignty with this. But then there was a point where I was ready to go to them to say, now do you understand? <laughs> now that we're out in the open, do you get it? And the Lord kept telling me over and over in my time with him, no, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that every step along the way. 
He says, between you and me, I just want you to be faithful, to do the right thing, to trust I'm at work. And the relationships that were created out of that are so amazing. They're so beautiful and nothing needed to be said. Now there are times God will have an opportunity for you to speak up and there are times we are to do that. But in this case, God was working in my heart with my tongue to tame my tongue, to think I had to control a situation. He said, no, trust me, no reason to revile, to return evil out of the abundance of your heart your words will be and he was doing a work in my heart to make it kind and sweet and long suffering and i didn't say things and i'm very grateful for that our words reflect our intent to heal or hurt i already mentioned that to you um i don't know if i went over these verses oh yeah i did um okay and then they reveal the condition of our heart. I've said that. And this is Matthew 10, 33 through 36. And it'll be a familiar passage to you about how the tree, the tree is known by what? It's fruit. You know, ladies, if you were to ask your kids, you have a reputation with them. If you were to ask your husband, he would characterize you as something. If you were to ask your good friends, they would characterize you as something. We're something, but what kind of fruit are we? In different times, we can be different types of fruit. I get that. But by and large, <laughs> a tree is known by its fruit. Either way, right? Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil of his heart, the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Now, I already read that in a different version. That was actually the message which, do y'all ever use Bible Gateway? I like to just, you know, click on there and see the different versions. I'm going to read an example. Um, this is Silver Boxes. Remember this book from a long time ago? Yes. Have y'all ever heard of it? That's because you're too young. Yeah. We graduated the same year, girl. <laughs> Silver. Wait, that means we're old, right? Have you had your birthday this year? Yes, I did. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> if y'all go to my website and look at the About Rhonda page, I redid it. I put bullet points because I heard you're supposed to do that, make it more interesting. And one of the things on there says, I started this website in my 40s, and then two weeks later it happened. Or something like that. Get it? Like, I, I get it? Okay. You don't get it? Okay, thank you. You get it? It just wasn't funny, okay? <laughs> okay. Anyway, she, Silver Boxes, it's about encouraging words. It's a beautiful book. As a senior in high school, Martha was the best typist in her school. She was sent to a state typing contest. Do y'all know what typing is, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say texting. <laughs> she was sent to a state texting contest. <laughs> with her manual typewriter. <laughs> Why did I choose this one? Okay, but listen, this is a great point. She typed an amazing 112 words a minute with no mistakes. She came in second. Another student with an electric typewriter typed six more words than she did. Martha remembers being very happy with second place. Upon proudly presenting her second place trophy to her mother, Martha was told, you could have won first place if you weren't so lazy. Less than 10 words were spoken, but Martha has never typed again. Death and life when the power of the tongue. 
for some of you that might bring back actually memories of the way your parents treated you or the way people spoke into your life. And if that's you, I want to ask you to forgive them. Forgive, give it to Christ and say, Lord, let me learn from those hurts and invest in people. And may my words not be like that to others. But our words damage or they bring life to people. I've shared several ways with you that I've hurt my kids. I know you've seen this before. Um, we're actually creating, with um, Cultivating a Home, we're creating our own plate that we hope to be ready by Christmas. <laughs> but this is the special plate. And one way that we try to honor people in our home or guests that are in our home is to be able to freely speak words of affirmation to others. And one of the things that is important in our home, and I hope it is in yours, if you've never heard this before, that today you'll begin to have a vision of this for your family, is that our kids of all ages, from the very tiniest when we'd have to whisper in their ear to tell them what to say, to now grown children, 25 and down, who can just look at a sibling, brother to brother, big sister to youngest, big brother to youngest sister, they can look at their eyes and speak life into them. And if they're not present, they can call and do that. Because a long time ago, somebody painted that picture for me, and I wanted that for my family. I grew up in a family that was so sweet and loving, and I'm sure if they had heard this idea, we would have done this as well. But I'm thankful to have learned it when my kids were little, and it goes like this. Somebody has the plate in front of them when we're eating, and after we finish eating, we honor that person. And so, uh, Jenny, if it was, if I'm talking with you at the table, first of all, this takes that you've trained your children to recognize the strengths of other people, that they just become good at it because you're role modeling to them in your home. Look how, instead of all the little paper trimmings, you're like, he's so creative. But you've said, you said you're teaching them the kind words to say, right? So you're teaching that perspective of the family members that you have. So somebody might get a special play because it's their birthday or because of basketball game that they won, or maybe you just need to speak life into one of your family members who needs a boost. So Jenny's my sister-in-law, and it actually was just her birthday. So Jenny has a special plate. So we ate, and we're just going around the table. And so I, let's say I start. So I say, Jenny, you are special today because you're my sister-in-law, and I'm thankful to have you in our family. And I love the way that you have been a blessing in my brother's life. I love how you add laughter. And you're so patient with him, and he's your hero. And I can see that. I really value in you how kind and gentle you are to other people. And Jenny, I've noticed all those things and that's why you're special today. And then we would just go around the table and the children would all speak to Jenny and we wouldn't have to prep them on it. Now, when they were younger, we did. We'd say, okay, grandparents are coming over today. It's a birthday. We're gonna give them a special plate. What are some things you admire about granddad? And then we'd rehearse it. Or if they were real little, we, they you know, couldn't think of things on their own, we would just whisper it to them because it's not about impressing. I'm not trying to make my children be impressive. It's training and process. <laughs> so I, if, if they didn't, they should have learned at least something. So I'd lean over and I'd say, I love you, granddaddy, you know, for the very youngest. You're special because you tickled me or you watch TV with me or whatever, okay? So that's a special plate and you don't have to have a special plate to do it, but I want you to think about the words that take place in your home. Are you creating that kind of culture where you speak to your husband like that? And where you speak to your children and they talk to each other like that. If you have a child that might be obstinate about that, that could be the case right here. 
And it may be the case from time to time. What you do is you take that child aside quietly. Maybe you don't make it an official time to talk. We got to talk. Don't do that. <laughs> but just as you go, it might be the two of you in a car alone or you're washing dishes while he's eating at the counter and you go, hey, we're going to do the special plate to your sister. And you play a really important role in your sister's life. I know that sometimes, you know, y'all irritate each other or she really, I know that she bothers you. But I want our family to be able to speak words into each other's lives that are kind and sweet. So what are some things that you think that she does well? Or what are some things you like about her? And you prompt them and then you explain what you're going to do. So they have a buy-in and that they do it. Does that help? Okay, so if you anticipate there being any problem, you address that before the situation happens. Or, okay, well, I'm going to give you a couple other examples, real life things, and then we're going to wrap it up. Bedwetting, that may take place in some of your homes. It did in ours for a very long time. It was exhausting, but I remember my mom being so patient with us about that and that could really hurt a child if they're made fun of or if you go put your things out there on the side outside to dry you humiliate them that could do damage if that's happened apologize if your husband's the one hurting the child you stand in the gap talk to your husband quietly about it and if he's not willing to see from the perspective of the child then you make sure you tell that child how loved they are and how we're still going to honor your dad, but he doesn't know the damage that that does. But you speak life into them while still respecting your husband that you disagree with in this. And you remove the things from being embarrassed that that was the situation. Or if your child's fearful of the dark or has different fears, if they're expressing that to you, Welcome them and use your words to encourage. Teach them, when I am afraid, I will trust in you, or songs that you want, scripture. Be patient with them as you go through that. If they spill something on the table, on the carpet, how do you react? See things through their perspective, an accident, if you yell at them and you're frustrated, you instantly have taught your child things are more important. You've taught them that, but it's not too late to change that. Next time you do it, go, you know what? I handled that differently than I want to handle it. Will you forgive me for being harsh with you? Accidents happen, and I'm still growing and learning, and I don't want to treat you like that. Be honest. Have a culture where you're in your home that you're honest like that. Help with homework? Frustrated? Do you make them feel dumb? Our words can do that. Or do you help? Do you assist? Do you give them the tools to be able to tackle it? The blog post that we did yesterday uh, was on making a banner. Did you see that one? Anybody? I, I'm baffled. This is for another day, another Cultivate. But I continue to be baffled at how we as Human beings seem to be trapped in a world where we don't speak words that breathe life into other people. If you think something nice, say it. In fact, you should catch yourself thinking something nice. You do. So you should catch yourself and think, I need to tell them. You know, like you're just passing by like, I like her shirt. I like your shirt. She's got such a sweet smile. I like your smile. Your smile is so contagious. Do you see? Just catch yourself thinking something nice and say it. And then if you hear something nice, pass it on. You tell me about her when we're alone. I'm going to say, can I tell her you said that? Text her. <laughs> she passed on this about you. Why aren't we free with our words like that? To encourage the body of Christ. To encourage the world. That's what we should be doing. As we do that, our children will do that. That should be in our homes. 
You should be free with your children. That is a great paper you did. I'm good with that, B, because I saw how hard you worked with it, on it. <laughs> or if you ask me, I'm gonna, you're going to get a C. Are you laughing about that? Your children get C's when they ask for help. <laughs> and, <laughs> so what happened was my son's roommate got this in college. He got this uh, acceptance, early acceptance to the uh, master's program, which is a big deal. 25 students, if you read it earlier, it said 40, but my son corrected me. It's been changed to 25 students get accepted in this. And he's a junior, so he's early acceptance too. It's a big deal. So we wrote, we did one of our banners for him and had people sign it. If you go look at the blog post from yesterday, we had famous people sign it. Who remembers some of the people that signed it? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Who else? Warren Buffett. <laughs> Rockefeller. And it said something like, you're worth coming back to life for, buddy. <laughs> they were all forged. <laughs> That's my personality. She's like, <laughs> sorry. You would have known not to be gullible. <laughs> now you know for next time. But we instantly made a banner, signed it and sent it to them. And you can read that blog post from yesterday on um, when you think, you know, when you hear something nice, pass it on about rejoicing with those who are, who are rejoicing. Another thing that we do is we will, if a kid says this, Terry, I bet you've experienced this before. She's a children's choir director. Who's probably a better musical director. Children's music director at our church, and it's a big church. We have these big musicals, children audition for them. There's always heartbroken children. So if you were the one with a heartbroken child, what are you gonna do? What if the same kids seem to be chosen all of the time? Again, look through the perspective of the other child. They're excited to get the part. The sayers doesn't, somebody else does. And you help your child who's like, they always get the parts. If they're doing that, they learn that attitude somewhere. Or their bent is like that and you have work to do. Either way, the next time that happens, it's time to say, that's exciting for them. Let's call them right now and congratulate them. Do you see the difference? Rather than me at the mom, as the mom, stewing in it, making it worse, calling my friends and, did your child get a part? I can't believe. I'm hoping people don't really do that. <laughs> I'm hoping that doesn't really happen. But we, we respond, we react certain ways. And in so doing, we're training our children. The Bible says rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Somebody got a part. And here's the thing. Tell your children you know she's prayed about it. And you also know God's sovereign. If he wanted you to get the part, you would have. So we're going to rejoice. So how do you respond to your children when they don't get their way? When somebody else gets the cheerleading spot or the part in the school play or the beauty pageant winner, teach them to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and to pray for them and to do good, to write them an encouraging note. So I want us as a group of women to see the beauty in others, other women and within our home, our families, and to speak the beautiful things, the words of encouragement that we see to breathe life, not death, into their lives. I hope that you've been encouraged by the encouraging words <laughs> and that we will allow God to work in our lives, to work to tame our tongues, which we will never master. It's a work in progress, but just realizing that blessings and cursings both come from our mouth and we want to bless others. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the time together tonight. May each lady in this room be very sensitive to your Holy Spirit, talking, speaking to them, to prick their hearts when they have something about to be out of their mouth that's unkind or hurtful, damaging, and may they control their tongue and speak life. Lord, I pray that for me too. May we be a women who are just different, Lord. May we represent what you say in your word. 
to encourage, to build up, to rejoice when others are rejoicing, to see through your eyes into the heart and the situations of others. We love you, Jesus. Amen.